Hello and welcome internet to Makers on Tap, the podcast where the makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and the maker culture around it. I am your host Christian and joining me this week are Aaron and Joe. And tonight we are going to be talking about a whole range of things from maker news to interesting maker leadership development or decisions, uh, open versus closed source software and hardware in the makerspace and some interesting new ideas for some nights that we may be having here soon. Uh, but first, as always, as we start off every week, what are you guys drinking tonight? I decided to switch it up this week after, you know, several weeks of the Kirkland Vodka and Cherry Coke. I have now moved on to some Grey Goose and Cherry Coke because I forgot to run out and get something else. <laughs> very nice, very nice. And I'm on some sticky toffee pudding ale, which is odd. Ale shouldn't be toffee flavored. <laughs> I Stout, yes. Ale? Mm. Interesting. Okay. Should it yeah. be that sticky? <laughs> <laughs> that Anyways. sticky icky. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I committed the cardinal sin and went to Wisconsin, uh, and didn't pick up spotted cow. Uh, so I am going with my pretty much always default soju. Um, but this week I am drinking a citrus soju, um, which mm -hmm. is really, really good. I'm going to have to bring it into the maker space for some of you guys to try. Um, it tastes very much like you're having, uh, like a watermelon Jolly Rancher, um, but it will mess you up. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so this week we have a couple different topics that we're going to be cut or uh, maker news that we're going to be covering. Uh, mainly a couple, two big things, and then uh, some personal project updates that we've been going since we started the podcast. Actually, some of us have either completed or have updates on our projects, and so. Uh, before we get into any of that, though, we did have some interesting news come out about Midwest Rep Rep Fest, and Joe, you wanted to kind of take the lead on that one. It's happening! <laughs> so, every year at the end of Midwest Rep Rep Fest, which if you don't know what it is, it is the biggest DIY 3D printer festival show conference whatever in america in the states uh and potentially the world and people literally come from all over the world to goshen indiana to hang out for three days and nerd out about diy home build 3d printers and it's the greatest weekend ever <laughs> if you are into uh any of those things absolutely so um Earlier this week, there was a uh, mix-up, and um, there was a Murph announcement released, and then immediately taken back, uh, well, the next day, uh, because there was just some mix-up between the organizers, and um, there was, uh, you know, some confusion between all of it, but then it got re-released, and I'm so excited because Murph is awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it looks... <laughs> it, we're excited to have it back on. It's been something that our makerspace has been a part of for a while. Um, yeah, we're this kinda, is its fifth year. Yeah. We were kind of talking about it a little bit beforehand. Um, something that's a little interesting is uh, why Goshen? Uh, we know that CME CNC is local uh, to that area, but why, why exactly Goshen? This is in the middle well, of nowhere. Indiana. Right. Well, and the best part of Goshen is you get to go into traffic with horse carriages. <laughs> um, In the middle of winter, kind of close yeah. to at least. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the end of winter. But, you know, th this has been a topic of Murph for the last couple of years because we do have international people that come to it. And, um, you know, it's hard to get to. And uh, the organizers of uh, Midwest Rep Rat Fest, which are uh, John Ollie, uh, formerly of CBCNC, and Steve Weingut of CBCNC, um, 
we were all talking about this because I had actually offered to help them host it in Peoria, which has an international airport and pretty good infrastructure to get to and a good tourist system. And uh, uh, it was a discussion, actually. And we also discussed having it in Chicago. And uh, the end was um, we wanted to keep it a pilgrimage. Hmm. Like, Murph is something special. And um, if you go to it, if you make the travel to the middle of nowhere, Indiana, it's because you care and you want to be there. And not because you're some random bystander that's like, huh, I wonder what's in here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so it, in order to keep it kind of a pilgrimage and to keep it uh, kind of pure, uh, the uh, decision was to keep it in middle of nowhere, Indiana. Well, and I'm kind of down for that. I, I get it. It's kind of so funny. It's, like, it's uh, like Burning Man, but with less fire. Right. Music <laughs> that, that was actually the uh, the reference that was made was uh, <laughs> it's like the Burning Man of 3D printers, but a little more tame. Well, personally, it, it's kind of funny that you make it the the reference to a pilgrimage because two funny things come up when you say that is um, one, yeah, there really is no like almost no chance of somebody just walking in who's local. Because it's surround, surrounded by the Amish. <laughs> and so, like, nobody from that local area really just comes to that. So, really, this festival is people just coming in from all over the place. Um, yes. But the funny part of pilgrimage, I would have to say, is uh, I don't know what happened last year because, un unfortunately, I wasn't able to go. But the two years before that, going to the convention or festival, we had issues <laughs> getting there. And it was oh, yeah. like at one point, Joe, you were so, like sticking out of a horse trailer, like <laughs> trying to get in there to figure things out. And it was like in the middle of this gas station, people were like questioning us what we were even doing. Were we supposed to be getting into this trailer? Um, oh, yeah. And it was. We had to oh. borrow a ladder from the guys that were working on the telephone pole in the, yeah. <laughs> of the gas station. It was so lucky that they were there. And what it was was we had a, a tire blowout on this trailer we were borrowing from one of the Makerspace members uh, to bring everyone's projects down with us. And um, yeah, that, that, that tire blew out, and then the tire that was directly in front of it was getting ready to blow out. So, And, and then the year before, uh, we had some issue with that same trailer. I can't remember what it was now. Uh, and then we had the year something before, hit it. No, that was a different trailer. Oh, was so it? Okay. We, we used that horse trailer two years in a row, and something happened with it. I can't remember. But then the, the first year we brought a trailer driving back we had like a chunk of something huge go through the trailer mm -hmm. and i i don't know how we didn't feel it because you know this was a it, an aluminum enclosed cargo trailer and something went through it <laughs> caused about two thousand dollars damage to the trailer so wow yeah yeah it wasn't it wasn't good that is why we now rent U-Haul trailers with walkaway insurance. <laughs> because yes. we're done with all those problems. So, no, we didn't have any, any trailer drama this last year. Um, other than Josh's truck was really not into the idea of pulling the trailer. Um, so, that was good. Well, it is, it is very much uh, in itself a pilgrimage to get there and... I kind of am for the idea of that. It's it's an interesting thought for sure. Um, yeah. Do you have anything more that you want to talk about that topic? Well, I I would just say that um, if you're interested in coming to Midwest Rep Rat Fest, if you've been on the fence in years past, um, come. This year is already shaping up to be an absolutely insane year. Uh, typically we don't start planning for Rep Rat Fest until December is usually when it gets announced. So it's gotten announced two months earlier this year. And um, the day that the uh, initial announcement was made, the one that was made accidentally, 
that day, one of the hotels in the area booked solid. And the other main hotel that everyone stays at, the Best Western, is last I heard had like two rooms left in it, according to Expedia. So um, lodgings are getting thin in the area. So I'm very, very excited for uh, the way this year is shaping up to be. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, very cool. Um, all right. With that, uh, our next topic or next bit of maker news is um, Google has announced that they are doing a new project called Project Stream. Uh, and this is a new thing that they are trying to roll out. Um, there was a news article done by a uh, YouTube and news channel called The No uh, on this topic. And basically, to summarize what they're they were kind of talking about was Google is trying to make it possible to do full um, uh, full 1080p stream for games in a web browser uh, like without any lag uh, and this is pretty impressive that they're that they're trying to do this um, and trying to make this streaming uh, platform viable. Um, they started off with a project around Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is a new game that's just come out from Ubisoft. Uh, and basically, you can sign up for a beta program to play the game in a Chrome browser uh, and see how it does. Uh, the only thing that they're kind of requiring at this point is that you have a down speed of 25 megabits. Um, but this kind of brought up a couple questions um, that I was really interested in. The video uh, that the Node did didn't really go into that this mu or that much, um, but I was interested on your guys' thoughts. One of the things that kind of came out of this was uh, in recent gaming kind of uh, developments, it used to be that everything was on hardware. So uh, N64 had cartridges, PlayStation had disc, Xbox had disc, and it kept going, going, going until this most recent generation where everything's kind of going digital. Uh, now with the hardware, you own that hardware. That was yours. You purchased it. It was in your house. Yeah. You could do whatever you want. Um, sort of. Well, yeah. In the, pa in the past, yes. Yes. Somewhat. Uh, with digital, there has been almost an agreement with uh, the company that you're talking to or you're buying from uh, that you can kind of mess with that. Um, a lot of co uh, companies, much like Bethesda, have made it so that you can mod, even some releasing their mod tools for that kind of thing, saying, yeah, you own it, like, you can do what you want to it, you don't have to necessarily go all the way. That not all companies do that, but that has been a kind of topic that has been precedent. With this new way that they're potentially talking about it, of games being a service, and you wouldn't necessarily own this thing. Um, this would be kind of the interesting point of, would you guys be interested in a service where you do not own the thing that you are using? Um, there's been other companies that have kind of done this in the past, but games kind of hit a certain hotspot for me because I love video games. Um, whereas like, I would love to be able to mod my game and if I'm not able to own that, then I really can't do that. If the files aren't locally on my computer, I really can't do that. Right. So this is kind of a turnoff for me and I, I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. Yeah. Um, with something like this, the, the game is being hosted and served from their cloud servers. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to assume you're going to lose any and all opportunity to mod unless they explicitly um, develop it so that you can like write mods for it. And then it's more like a web UI thing where you're like, include these mods. Cause I know Xbox um, made and Microsoft made some sort of deal with them um, with Beth um, Bethesda on fallout. What for? Yeah. Which th they're going to do mods on the Xbox, which you can't really, you know, develop, you can't like literally log into your Xbox and mod the game files. Yep. So somebody's developing that mod on a on a desktop or a computer and uploading it to some mod marketplace. Yeah. So that could be a potential there, but you definitely would be moving more towards that game as a service, and whether that's a one time fee 
to buy access to the game or they do some sort of cheap monthly model or if more and more games just go um uh free to play or you know premium freemium whatever yeah yeah modes i will say i read through the documentation that google's released for this project and they're specifically calling it a technology test and yeah. they their target was let's see so they said that you know streaming online media video and whatnot is uh gr it's becoming one of the most consumed ways or the most the biggest way to consume video and other digital media is by streaming like you see with twitch and all those other you know things where it's it's now we, it's not just i'm watching a youtube video you're watching a youtube you're watching a video with all these other people watching the same thing and you're interacting and you you may even be interacting with the person hosting the show mm -hmm. and um but you know as you're seeing you know there's a lot of lag there's some latency what you, you know not not just between the player and the game but between the player and the viewers um so i think what google is shooting for they're looking to just revamp the way that people consume streaming media and they're using a gaming platform with the uh, assassin's creed game as the most um hardcore usage of this new technology so if they can make it work with that it will work for pretty much every other use case that you might come up with for that technology. So, well, and that's been something that they've been uh, that they kind of hit a lot in the article was they were shooting for this almost unheard of 4K 60 frames in a browser. That's um, yeah, crazy. Uh, yeah, up until now, that's like even right now, it's not possible. Um, you'll see some things say 4K streaming. Um, that is pretty much always 4K at thir or 30 frames per second. Um, and so that's it, although it looks good and it is a good stream, um, it's using an incredible amount of bandwidth and it's still not hitting 60. Um, so that's, that's kind of something that like, it would be cool if they would actually be able to do that and also have the refresh rate to do button inputs. Um, but as you were saying, I don't necessarily think this is a huge thing for, um, just the gaming atmosphere but it's more something to push the hardware. Google is right. not just doing this as a, hey, we want to get into streaming. They're doing it as a, hey, we want to push you guys to actually do more technology development. Uh, I think the last time we really saw Google do something like this was Google doing this with Fiber. Um, I, I was just thinking about that. Yeah. yeah, so if Google goes out and they start laying Google Fiber, they, uh, especially the one I know the most about, because I listen to a whole bunch of podcasts from that area, is Austin, Texas. Uh, Google lays down the fiber in Austin. All of the other companies immediately offer fiber service and at a lower rate. And I think that's exactly wow. what Google was going for. Is like, you guys need to start getting on the level of the rest of the world and you need to stop monopolizing this market because it's getting freaking ridiculous. And so as much as like Google can sometimes be um, a little bit scary and almost Skynet-like, uh, there is some times where they come out and they are really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a love-hate thing for me right now because they also came under fire with their whole Google AMP project, which is the accelerated mobile pages. Mm. And they're trying to get the mobile browsing experience to be faster. But they're doing that by caching everything on Google servers and using their CDN stuff. So a lot of people are saying it's undermining the foundations of the web so like, there's a lot of stuff going on with that, um, but they are they are doing a lot of great stuff for open source and pushing industries forward. So it's kind of it's it's definitely a love hate thing for me. No, absolutely. All I want to see is somebody do a streaming service with GPU accelerated software that's not games. <laughs> I think if this was to absolutely take off we could absolutely see stuff like that happen um like if, fusion in a browser yeah that's kind of what i was pointing to it would be <laughs> really not, cool but not browser like okay so what drives me nuts is so many of these services exist like um the nvidia streaming stuff through the shield mm -hmm. and um yeah game stream through steam and all oh. of this stuff is is 
game focused, but I can't run anything else. And I want to be able to run other things. So I want to be able to carry around my Chromebook Pixel or my XPS 13 and be able to stream from my powerful desktop at home to run CAD or yeah. Illustrator or something like that. Just like I can play Titanfall <laughs> on those <laughs> at 60 frames a second. You know, there's there's no reason why these two things can't coexist is just nobody's working on the other side because they're only working on games. Yeah. Well, and I you think... Want, so you want a protocol. Not necessarily just things streamed yes. to a browser. You want a protocol that apps can integrate with. Yes. Okay. I think... And it exists. That's the thing that drives me nuts. Is like yeah. It exists. It's just nobody's pointing it at other things. They're only pointing it at games. Maybe you should do it, Joe. I'm not good at code. <laughs> There's only one way to get better, Joe. Go yeah. back in time 10 years and start over in my career. <laughs> Write more <Just> code. <laughs> <laughs> Just go ahead and start developing your own platform right now. Right. Um, I think when it really comes down to it, 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 I hate to make this comparison, but I, I feel like it's the only thing I can really compare it to. Um, stuff like this, technology development, really gets pushed for by games and the best comparison it comes to is how porn has affected the video market um oh, totally no yeah, porn totally. always pushes everything forward yeah. it's insane and i think the exact same thing can be made for games so it's like yeah first this is all going to be developed for games because that's the biggest market that they can but once this once this resource is available either open source or it starts just getting out there finally um, I think it'll absolutely start going down to those other processes to just be offloaded on either central servers and do stuff like that and make it available to do stuff like that. I, I think it's coming soon because really the projections right now, uh, or like projections, the rumors right now that are out there are saying that uh, 2020 Xbox pushes to have a fully streaming console available alongside a normal console um, but they will have a full streaming console available in 2020. So um, I think if they're going to push to have that kind of stuff already available the way then, I think this this resource starts to become available to other companies very quickly. Because see, just away from video games, it would be freaking awesome if I could like offload all my rendering for After Effects yeah. just to be able to like render a full effect in After Effects with no issues. To be able to run it on like my mom's Chromebook and just be able to like export everything and then run it in there would be amazing. Um, yep. And so I can totally get like just CAD uh, and CAM software being able to offload all that processing power would be awesome. And I, I very much see it happening hopefully soon. Yeah, because then like I could dump a desktop at one of my friend's houses that has gigabit. And just hmm. and just go. Who do we and, know that has gigabit fiber here? <laughs> and uh, you know, yeah, it's working real good. I can see on the camera right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, no, that's awesome. Um, so yeah. that's that's that news. Um, you guys have anything else you want to say about that? I want to say that this is the shortest news section we've had yet. And it's taking the longest. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sorry, Murph. Murph and stuff I'm passionate about. You can't get in the way yep. of. Um, so now, uh, really cool, we're just going to go over some quick, cool progress updates. Um, actually, the first episode that we had of the Makers on Tap podcast, we did uh, projects. And we talked a little bit about the projects that we're working on. And uh, Aaron... You have a big milestone that you just did. Yes. Uh, what happened? So for the past two months, um, I've been working on that new uh, motorized table design for our K40 laser. And last week, I had gotten the design about 95% done after about two months of, you know, various free times and weekends so that I can work on it. I got it pretty much all the way done, and then I take a look at it, and I say, you know what? I hate everything about this. I just, I woke up the next morning, and I just hated my design, everything about it. So I started from scratch. 
Fair and enough. this entire week, I've dedicated you know every moment of free time to it, and I've already come up, I've already completed a second design, and it's way better. It's it's way simpler. Um, it's based off the Holga, Holga mods um, Z table design, which uses like one inch aluminum tubing. Uh, I redesigned it to use fifteen millimeter extru aluminum extrusion, so we save about half the height that they spend on tubing. Um, uh, and then uh, we also I'm also incorporating a removable top to the to the bed, so that you can um, access like the tensioner screws and then vacuum up the bottom of the K40 from all the crap that falls down. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so I'm really excited to have it all done. I actually just ordered all of the um, the components today from AliExpress and McMaster Car. Um, and then the extrusion, you can actually order from like order uh, specific lengths from Misumi. And that's what I plan on doing because I plan on open sourcing this once I get it all done and tested and making sure it works. Mm -hmm. So I want it to be repeatable and accessible for anybody. So there'll be a nice um, bill of materials ready to go and you can just plug stuff into your, you know, your um, browser and buy all the right things in this. It all just screws together, which is one thing I wanted to do too, because a lot of the whole mod designs relies on epoxy and epoxying stuff to each other. And I don't like stuff that you can't reverse. So oh, okay. everything is held in by screws. So I'm still really excited that it's, that I actually accomplished a design. Now the next phase is actually building it, which I'm, um, I have a feeling it's going to be a whole nother challenge. Nah, you'll be fine. It'll yeah. Be fun. <laughs> I'm excited to see it, especially like just getting the lasers back up and running at the space. Um, will be really that cool. That was another reason I was pushing is because that laser has been out of commission for a good two or three months now, even before the move. So I want to really push to get all of our machines working. Yeah. Yep. No, that'll be so that's it for me. That'll be awesome. Um, cool. So, uh, the two projects that I talked about uh, on the first podcast were my uh, Gundam cabinet, which I kind of built and kind of just got together, and then my gaming table, which both actually are kind of completed. Um, I was able to acquire some really cool cases that I did some customization on, which actually went up on our Facebook and Twitter for our... Uh, Makerspace account, which I didn't know they were going to be. Um, and so that's kind of cool, but um, <laughs> it was... Uh, clearly communicated that anything that goes into that specific black <laughs> channel is fair game to be published in, in social media. It's a yes. pinned message in the Slack channel. No, and I, I totally <laughs> yes. get that. I didn't know I posted it in, in that channel. <laughs> so... Oh. Uh, mainly because, and we have kind of stated that, yes, we are trying to be family friendly, but for this specific instance, I will describe what it says. Um, it does in Katakana say giant effing robots. And so I was kind of like, oh, I don't know if we should actually post that on there because if anybody actually uh, knows how to read Katakana, it would be interesting. <laughs> um, they'll be fine. But, it, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, I'm also going to do some custom design work on the gaming table um, and kind of get that rolling here soon once we get the laser table up and running. Um, so, yeah, I've actually accomplished both my goals that I set out for. Uh, Joe, you had one project in particular that I thought was really cool. You made some, uh, some really cool curtains uh, or dressing room curtains. Uh, you want to talk any about that? Uh, yeah, sure. I needed to make a mobile dressing room set up for uh, my wife's burlesque troupe. And uh, she gave me an idea that was was uh, far too simple. <laughs> and then I made it far too complicated. Um, but it has their, their logo uh, cut out it, uh, four times on each panel. And then I backed it with sparkly white felt and the panels are actually removable and replaceable. So we can make uh, panels of other colors for different events. And um, they turned out really good. I was really happy with them, but in true me form, I put the last screw in them uh, about a minute and a half before I was supposed to be at the location with them. Um, so, you know, that was fun <laughs> to figure out that, but it worked out. So, yeah. very cool. 
Um, yeah, so that kind of wraps it up for projects. We'll kind of keep you guys updated on things we're working for, I think. Um, we'll all be really excited to see how the laser table ends up coming together uh, and getting that back up and running hopefully soon. Uh, and we'll make sure to post pictures of our other projects that we're kind of working on either in the show notes or on our own social media and Reddit. Uh, so that brings us to running a makerspace. Uh, we kind of are running a new idea um, that hopefully we're thinking about doing. Uh, brought up by the uh, creators of this, the Xenocraft uh, Hackerspace. Xerocraft. Yep, Xerocraft Hackerspace, sorry. Um, they are doing something cool called a WTF night. Uh, women, trans, and femmies. Uh, night alone so this is kind of a cool night it's kind of like a just a women's only um night for a maker space to make it so everybody kind of feels safe at the space um it creates a cool atmosphere for people just to be themselves in that um joe do you want to talk any more um maybe about this idea um just we've had uh feedback and you know I think anyone that's been in a makerspace and paid attention um, can kind of see that it can be a, an intimidating space for um, women just because they, it, especially our space is so uh, heavily um, male on our, our um, uh, membership. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, this is kind of an, an effort to, uh, to make it more accessible and more inclusive, even though I, you know, removing a, a certain, um, like asking men to not come for a night may seem exclusive to some people. It's actually, um, you know, making it a more accessible space to somebody who may or may not be comfortable with, uh, with that. So, uh, we're gonna try it out and see how it goes. Um, it's worked really, really well for uh, Zero Craft, and I've talked to some other spaces that do women's only nights, and uh, they seem to. I, I have yet to come across a space that said it didn't work out for them in a positive manner. So, and that's cool. Um, as soon as it was mentioned, we've had a number of our, um, well, really all of our women mem- women members. Uh, step up and say they would be interested in helping host it um and even my wife was like you know i i think i would actually go to that and and she's been to the space like four times so (laughs) um yeah i i think it's uh i think it's good and i'm excited to see how it goes yeah absolutely we're uh hopefully going to be having some more news on that here soon uh we're going to bring it before the membership here on our next meeting and we will hopefully have some more updates for when that is actually going to start happening here soon so with that uh we go into our main topic for the night um this episode uh may go a little bit long um and may get a little bit heated um it better and so with that we go into the topic of Open versus closed source software and hardware in a maker space. Um, gentlemen, your arguments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I suggested this topic today when we were trying to figure out what, what we should talk about. And with, with such a, a, a small news section, uh, it was supposed to be a short news section. <laughs> Between me and Joe, we, we would be able to fill up a good... 45 minutes of just this yes but um my my point was we've had a lot of discussion between the officers um mostly just me being very arrogant and annoying but when how how should a makerspace approach software and hardware when it comes to open versus closed source um whether they should um side they, they should choose from ideological reasons or practical pragmatic reasons um, and there's pros and cons for each side. And I used to be super dogmatic in we should only ever use open source, even if it sucks because it's open source and we control it. 
but in the past year or so I've softened up a lot and I am now more of, we should try to be, try to use open when it works, but a lot of times when it sucks, we should just use what works right. and what's accessible. So, uh, I mean, and, yeah. And that's where I stand. You know, I came from working for uh Lulzbot or ALF objects where if it wasn't open source with specific licensing, like we even had open source licenses that we couldn't touch. Really? Um, we were just simply not allowed to use it. And if that was a software that we required for a specific job function, he just didn't do that job. Like I remember we were um, having issues with uh, a specific part of our manufacturing and um, it was uh, something that was being outsourced. And I was like, okay, well, you know, if we can, uh, if we can detail our prints in this specific way, um, I think we can clear up a lot of this confusion that's happening. And there wasn't a way to detail the prints with that using our engineering software. So they're just like, well, we'll just keep dealing with it and, and keep arguing with the manufacturer then because uh, you know we have to stay open source. So we we can't we we can't go outside. Our, our ways <laughs> so thousands of dollars of manufacturing costs later we finally got the point across of what we were trying to do when we simply could have just sent a properly marked up print um it was bad uh, <laughs> like having flashbacks anyway the point <laughs> is um you know there are open source software is amazing and it's wonderful when you can contribute back to the community. And that was always, um, the big push was, you know, even if it sucks, we're going to use the software because then we can contribute feedback back to the comp to the community and make the software better. Right. Mm -hmm. Did they only contribute feedback or did they bother with contributing code or development time? Yes. It depended on the project and okay. um, if we had the expertise to contribute code and time, you know, mm -hmm. um, or time to contribute back. But yes. Um, and uh, most of the software that we used, um, there are uh, repos at code.alefobjects.com where you can go and you can like look at the contributions that, um, ALF has done to things like FreeCAD and Inkscape and Blender, um, where they're you know contributing code and time back and feedback and uh, bug fixes and things like that, and you know that was great. But there were also times where you know, we were on a development branch of FreeCAD, and like we just couldn't work for a few days because FreeCAD was broken <laughs> and and the save button crashed everything. Jeez. You know? So. <laughs> That's yeah. a little bit different use case, though. You know, that's a that's a company paying employees for their time, and if and if your software doesn't work as an employee, it's like, well, my company sanctioned tool doesn't work. I guess I'm gonna sit until it works. Right. But as a makerspace, we are providing services to our members, and if that doesn't work, then they're coming back to us angry and upset. Yes. Right. In like so, I, a makerspace yeah. should constantly. I feel like we should always look at three things and, and the main ones are um, ease of use, ease of accessibility and uh, ease of learning curve. Right. So like something that's easy may not necessarily have the best learning curve. Right. 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 Um, like uh, I, I'm going to throw out an example. Lightburn is a very easy software to use but it's not necessarily the most intuitive software to use if you've never used a laser cutter before right right um but once you get past that it's like oh man this is so easy compared to some of the other ones once right. you get past the learning curve mm -hmm. um yeah so for me it's more of a matter of control because our since our makerspace is 100 percent volunteer run and our our funds are generally low as far as income that um 
each additional monthly cost or yearly cost adds up over time. So the great thing with open source is either you you could you could download a version and you'll just you own the rights to that version as long as you own as right. long as you have control over it. So whenever I try to push for open source software at the space, it's it's from a, 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 a position of control where we control when that software gets updated. You know, it, we can choose to support it as long as we want. Um, no one's going to take that freedom away from us. We are free to use it as long as we can or need or want. Um, well, <laughs> but and also as a you know, with an an example, we have a a Glowforge currently in the space which is pretty neat because it's a really nice piece of equipment. But the very first time someone tried to use it, they're like, Hey Aaron, do we have a shared shared email account so I can log into the Glowforge and use it? Yeah. And I'm like, huh, we need an email address and account to use a piece of equipment. Yep. And then you run into a whole other, a whole other issue. It's like, well, does the Glowforge terms of service allow shared use of something? Because then now that becomes a thing because we're using that equipment now. I don't know if it's considered commercial use or not, but like that's something you have to consider now is the licenses and the terms of service of the equipment that you're using yep. when it's closed source. And that's just a whole nother ball game that you have to then consider. Well, I mean, it's the same deal with open source licensing, though. Like a lot of open source licenses don't necessarily allow commercial use, even though they are free to use. So, well, man, I, this is such a, this is such a topic. <laughs> I know. And that like, I think my end coming from it is ease of use. And then also, um, being able to use it as a, as a learning, uh, or as a skill, um, I really want the makerspace to be somewhere where people can come to and use equipment easily and also learn easily. And if we were to, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, if we were to go with Aaron a year ago with where he was then, uh, every computer in the space would be Linux uh, and every computer in the space would be running all open source software. Where is like people who came to the space this past uh, Thursday were able to just hop on the uh, Glowforge and start using it within about ten minutes. They were they were starting to go with it. So it's like I I know that as I, long as Windows doesn't want to update. <laughs> yes, yes. But when it comes down to it, even in that case, I, I think the Glowforge software is all web-based, so even in that case, it probably wouldn't affect anything. So I would just be able to just update and not do it. Yes, updating Windows is a pain in the butt. It's affected our podcast more times than I can count, and it's affected my computer, especially for a while, since I, for some reason, was running a European version of Windows. And even Windows doesn't know how that got on there. <laughs> um, and so it just like deleted all my drivers every time it updated. Um, so yeah, there, there absolutely is problems with open source and closed source. Um, but I've always, when it comes to the space, been let, we need to equip people with skills rather than ideas. Um, if we as people want to promote ideas, that's perfectly fine. I think that we're absolutely there to do that. But the space itself has always been something that I think we should be ready to equip people rather than teach. I agree. Yeah. But here's here's one thing. Um, with free and open source software, it, they generally respect the user. And they won't do things unless the user um, requests it. So, for instance, Windows updating whenever it feels it's necessary it does that without user, you know, without user action. So that's why people get upset with things getting automatically updated when they weren't expecting it, or they're literally in the middle of a project, mm -hmm. um, or even with the latest windows updates where it's now randomly deleting files off of your system. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, at least they pulled that update mid release. Right. But, but like, to your point, Christian with equipping people, um, one of my favorite things about free and open source software is um, 
when I have taught workshops in the past on uh, something like Inkscape or Blender, um, you know, I'm able to, as part of the class, I load up a flash drive with all of the class files and, and the installers for the software. And I, I can say to the students at the end of the class that flash drive is yours. Go put that software on your computer and rerun through all these exercises and utilize all those files because the software is free. Um, and that's that's awesome. And free is in freedom. Yeah, like you know, I I I've done that with Girl Scout classes. I've done that at the Makerspace. Um, and you know, the Girl Scouts in particular were super cool because we did this really fun workshop with lasers, and at the end of it, um, I was able to put all of the girls' designs onto each of their flash drives and then hand them back and be like, here's all the stickers you guys made and or all the designs for the stickers that you guys made. And um, also here's the software so you guys can go home and you can play with these designs yourselves. And uh, you know, they they thought that was super cool. And you know, yeah, that, that's awesome. That may have started the maker journey for them. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Well, and that's I. I say that, and I'm not opposed to open source software at all. It's right. it's just something where it's like I I want the space to be what I say is is to equip, and so I've kind of been um, in some conversations, not all, uh, the lone wolf in saying like I would love for Adobe products to be at the space for us to be able to teach people with industry leading software so that they can come to the space learn on software that they could actually be using in a job uh, atmosphere yeah, totally. and be able to walk away with that. Um, there is people who are totally cool with it. I have, I have faced a few people who argue, um, but that's something I've been so about. Hmm. It's like, <laughs> is who being those able people to, be? I, dude, I wasn't going to call you out. I wasn't going to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't mind. I don't mind. If you want me to call you out. Yeah, no. I'll, yeah. I will say, I will say you, year ago, Aaron was in a very dark place <laughs> <laughs> and that guy was a jerk. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. No, I, well, and you have points, dude. Like we were just talking about this week, um, about the codes for whether we want to do one single rotating code or individual, um, individual codes per person and it was like for our for our electronic door lock yes yes um and you 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 have arguments i totally see them as valid um and so it's like it's never been a hard thing to like have a discussion with you um no i enjoy having these discussions with people i love seeing different opposing viewpoints you know yeah no it's so go ahead oh but I, I was just going to say, in, in the interest of like coming out with a clear and concise uh, way of, of saying this and not dragging this episode past an hour, um, <laughs> I, I think we're, we are all to a point now, though, where we agree that on, on the ethos of open source when it makes sense. Yes. You know, yeah. We open all... source when possible. Yes. But sometimes it's not possible or it sucks. Yeah. And go with what's easier. <laughs> the uh, We have a lot more technical background. And so for us, like adapting to software is pretty easy. Yeah. I It should always be, is my grandma able to walk into the space and use this? And <laughs> if the answer is no, we might need to pay for something. <laughs> yeah. In the interest of support, or in the interest of sane officers and uh, instructors, um, that that ethos is pretty good. Yeah. Um, but you know, for the most part, we we push for open source where we can, and we push for education towards open source everywhere we can. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes it just sucks. <laughs> Like I tried, I tried finding an open source um, way to slice and control an SLA printer, and all that all that's out there is Monkey Print, that some guy threw together, and then Lulzbot added a bit to it to make it better. But it's still very, it hasn't been made. It's not maintained, right? So all the dependencies are outdated, and it doesn't run well. And then no. last year, I spent a good month 
trying out all the different open source CAD and CAM software packages. And Joe, the entire time, is like, just do Fusion. Just do Fusion. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 dude. Open source. I'm going to do it open source, you know. <laughs> and I tried all of them. And they all have their quirks. And But I even spent a whole weekend in, in open SCAD making a wallet, a slim wallet design. And it took me... It, and the thing I love about Open Open SCAD is that it's all code based. So you're you are three D modeling using code. Yeah. And as a developer, that's sweet for me. Yeah. It was fun. But it took me an entire weekend to model this wallet, and then here Joe does a Fusion tutorial the next day. He's like, "I'm gonna do Aaron's wallet design," and it takes him ten minutes. <laughs> and that that sold it for me. That <laughs> you know, open source is great, but the open source CAD options out there aren't great right now. No, yeah. fair enough. But they're getting better. I mean, FreeCAD is, are. is a good project, and uh, the developers are working hard to make it a really solid tool. So I want to give credit where credit's due. Like, yep. Um, the yeah, FreeCAD, which also has a really solid uh, CAM package. Like, it's I I've ran their CAM to actually make things, so I can say that it is definitely usable. Um, and then there's some other ones that are, are coming out now, like, uh, um, Oh, the open uh, build stuff. Yeah. Open builds. Open yeah, builds. Parts I'm excited are, for that. That's going to uh, be sweet. They have a, an open source easel competitor that is, uh, seems very cool. I'm going to be playing with that on the little micro mill that we talked about in our first episode. That's still not done. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so there's some really good stuff out there for, open source CAD, but yeah, very cool. Um, do you guys have anything more that you want to, you want to throw that towards? I totally could. Yeah. <laughs> like three episodes worth, man, but yeah, we're he, already at 50 minutes. Yeah. No. At some point I'd love to have a call in debate where like people can call and like we can argue with our our listeners on things like this because man that would be so much fun <laughs> maybe we should do like a twitch stream with it or something no i'd absolutely be about something like that where we could we uh, could do a, live stream a, a with google responses. yeah we could do a google project stream stream <laughs> When yeah. that's released. Well, yeah. Google or uh, YouTube has its own streaming platform. So wherever we can find an audience, um, we can absolutely do that. In fact, um, if you guys have nothing more, why don't we go ahead and say, uh, hey, if you guys have any more suggestions for topics, or if you guys would like to see a stream where we can have an open debate on open versus closed source or any other kind of cool topics or discussion ideas that you may have, uh, please find us on social media, on Makers on Tap, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, hopefully coming soon. Uh, you can also go to our website, makersontap.com. You can submit any questions that you might want there. Uh, just use the cool submit a question form. Uh, if you do, be aware. It may be read on stream, and we may be having a topic about what you uh, discussed. We also brought up, for sure, if you are interested in talking about uh, your projects, uh, we would love to see them. Uh, you can post them there as well or link to them on any of those social medias. We do have our own Reddit uh, as well, if you would like to post anything on there. Uh, we would also like to thank the other podcasts that we are part of from the Podcast Alliance. Um, thank you so much to all of them who have been cross-promoting us on their streams. Uh, if you would like to see any of those, you can check out Podcast Alliance on iTunes.com uh, or in the podcast app for Apple. Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening, and, uh, well, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. And keep making stuff. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thanks, guys.